Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this last session of our long seminar today. And this last session will be dedicated to differentiated trajectories in South Asia. We have spoken a lot of things today. We have spoken of governance in India this morning. We have spoken of the economy. We have spoken of uh, strategic trajectories as well. We have spoken of the strategic issues that South Asia is faced with. The question we haven't addressed yet is the question of the state legitimacy. And this is what we will do in this last session. And the question of state legitimacy is basically two things. It comes to the question of governance and the more or less good governance and the relation, I mean, the, the acceptance of the governance by uh, of the, 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 the leadership by the, uh, by the citizen is also a question of politics per se. And this is very much a South Asian issue than the issue of democracy. I mean, it's not, as in other parts of the world, a place where democracy has been totally absent in any of the countries that will be discussed this afternoon. It's also a reality that the democracy could never really consolidate in a serious manner in any of the three countries that we'll discuss this afternoon, or let's put it differently, that it still has some fragilities. So to discuss this this afternoon, we have three eminent panelists. I'm very happy to introduce my dear colleague, Sarah Shays, who is well known to many of you. She's an associate at the Carnegie Endowment, and she is a real expert on, on, on Afghanistan. And by a real expert, I mean that she actually lived there and for quite some time and worked in various capacities, both as a, an NGO leader, both as a journalist, and also worked with, uh, <clears throat> with the U.S. forces and, and uh, General Malay in particular. We will also have uh, Chris Fair. You, most of you familiar with South Asian affairs. No, Chris, she's a good specialist of South Asia. She knows the inside out of Pakistan, Afghanistan, in, or Pakistan, Afghanistan, India. And we'll finally have, or not fi so finally, and I will come back in a minute on that, have Maniza Hussain, who is a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute, but also the director of ITEFAC, the uh, Bangladeshi Journal of Reference. So with all three speakers, I think we all set for an interesting last panel. Uh, let me say also that I'm particularly happy to have a speaker on Bangladesh. Here is the one other big country of the continent, only 160 people, uh, 160 million people, sorry, who is almost never spoken about, uh, who has been an integral part of this big drama that has been the succession of partition in the subcontinent, and I'm particularly happy to have somebody able to speak here from, uh, from uh, within this. With this, well, I'll just leave the, uh, the floor to Sarah for the first intervention of Afghanistan intolerable governance. Thanks for uh, hanging in, all of you. It has been a long but a very, uh, I think, uh, personally rich and, and diverse day. Um, this panel is meant to sort of suggest at least some parallels among um, the, the democratic or state-building trajectories of uh, three countries at least. And I'd like to start out by saying, of course, Afghanistan um, isn't really comparable in this regard to any of the countries in the region in the sense that um, – the state building process, particularly in the last decade, but not only in the last decade, has kind of been out of the hands of the Afghans. Now, to a degree, that's true of all countries. There are externalities, but I think we can take as a given that the externalities in the case of Afghanistan are quite significant. Um, and for that same reason, uh, it's likely to have uh, a disproportionate or at least disproportionately unpredictable, uh, its trajectory is likely to have a disproportionate impact on the trajectories of some of its neighbors. Um, uh, so the first thing I'd like to say is that in spite of rhetoric that seem to go first against the notion that the external actors, in particular the United States, would, be, would take on a state building or democracy building function, rapidly changing to Marshall Plan and we are doing state building, and then a kind of reversal to let's not do state building. In my experience, 
there really never was a serious and concerted state building agenda on the part of international actors in Afghanistan. Um, as I said, rhetoric for a while seemed to go in other directions, but fundamentally, every time I saw um, agendas conflict, the agenda that really consist consisted of targeting potential military enemies took precedence over a state building agenda. And so the result I think in after at least these 10 or 11 years has been what's typically described as a relatively non or largely non-functional state. Weak lack of capacity, lack of manpower, lack of capability, lack of infrastructure of all kinds, both visible and non-visible infrastructure for Afghan um, institutions. And that's kind of where we take it and we sort of think about how is such a weak institutional structure going to weather um, the sucking chest wound of withdrawal of a lot of the externalities. I'd like to um, focus on one dimension of, um, of what has been built. I mean, the question is, okay, if a state wasn't built, what has been built. Um, and I think I've got a, a single slide. Don't be alarmed at the complexity of this slide. And those of you who have seen it already, forgive me. Arguably, what has been built is a very highly functional, highly operative, structured, complex organization that just happens not to be a government. It's a criminal organization <laughs> whose objective is to extract resources. And it does this very effectively. Um, and, and, and I'm just simplifying. I know that I'm being provocative and, and uh, reductive. Um, let me reduce the reductiveness just a little bit to say it's not a single organization. The, what those ovals are meant to describe up at the top is that it's really, you can think of it as a set of interlocking, rival but allied, vertically integrated criminal organizations. You can think roughly like a mafia situation where you've got several crime families that roughly divide up territory. I've got the waterfront, you've got the area up by the mountaintop, um, uh, I've got the gambling, you know, you've got the garbage. And when there are um, weaknesses in transitions or something like that, that's where the rivalries can break out. I'd just like to explain this very schematically what this, um, what this is meant to depict. In a normal governmental system, and that goes for a healthy patronage system, this is often, Afghanistan is often called a patronage system. In fact, a patronage system is redistributive when it, when it works effectively. It, it, it involves cronyism, but money is going downwards in a patronage system. What's very significant about this system is the money, and, and in a happy regular government like ours, allegedly, they tax us, and then the money goes downwards in the form of federal programs and block grants and decent salaries for public officials, of which I hope none of them are here to tell me otherwise, um, and things like that, and everybody's happy, I mean, schematically. This, it's really critical that money is going upwards in the system, and it goes upwards in the form of kickbacks, bribes, purchase of office, things like that. What go downwards from the summit of the system is, number one, permission. And by that, I mean permission to extract resources. And there's a tendency to think the only resources around are, um, you know, foreign assistance and opium. There's actually quite a lot, and they're mentioned up top on the left. I won't go through them all. But, you know, along with donor money and contracts and opium, you've got the extortion. You know, they're just the, quote, petty corruption, which is shaking people down um, on street corners or by judges, et cetera. It actually amounts to between $1 and $2.5 billion a year, according to two 2010 uh, studies. So it's actually significant. It's about Afghanistan's GDP. Um, 
And you have, you know, land grabs and you have bank fraud, you know, Kabul Bank was a, a, a pretty big example that was exposed, but there's at least half a dozen other banks that function the way Kabul Bank did, which means effectively as Ponzi schemes. And so you've got basically, I mean, you've got a billion dollar hole in the Kabul Bank and the others aren't quite as big, but, but you're talking significant amounts of money. Arrest is kidnapping is another one that I don't think we think of very often. You could call that a form of the extortion, but, um, but that happens very frequently. Customs is another really big one. You can consider Afghanistan. Um, it's not in the subcontinent. Uh, it's not quite in Central Asia either. So what Afghanistan, I like to think of it as... You've, you, you've strategically or geostrategically, you've got three basins of population. You've got Central Asia, the Indian subcontinent, and the Iranian plateau. You've got a wall more or less dividing these three incredibly important regions, and you've got two doors in the wall, and Afghanistan sits on them, which means that one of its most important natural resources is its geographic situation, and that translates into money in terms of customs revenue. But what you have is permission to extract resources. What that means is the central government allows the governors who sit on the key border crossings to simply pocket the vast majority of um, customs revenues, them and their, and their networks. So anyway, um, that's really what we've built. And... Um, let me just bring in opium is a classic, and I tend not to talk about opium, but as we think of, of um, what Afghanistan's, as we think of Afghanistan as having developed into a criminal organization, the government of Afghanistan having developed into a criminal organization, opium is a really big one. Uh, Afghanistan provides 90% of the world's supply. I just looked at the hectareage because when you look at the, either the price or the quantity of opium in any given year, that depends on climate, on diseases, on price, et cetera. Hectareage has gone up every single year. We're up 18% in 2012 over 2011. This is according to the UNODC Office of Drugs and Con Crime. They've got a very methodologically sound survey that they put out every year. And 2011 was 7% more area compared to 2010. And the other thing that's a significant change from when I first was there, you know, I, 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 I had been living there more or less continuously since 2001, is um, uh, refinement. So it used to be Afghanistan played the role of a, of a um, essentially a third world country exporting raw materials to other countries that added the value and then got the, um, the surplus return. You now have a significant amount of um, refining of opium into heroin inside Afghanistan. Um, and the other thing I think, just another sort of example of how serious this organization has become is money laundering. So back to Kabul Bank, uh, Kabul Bank was a very important issue for the population of Afghanistan in that it was a Ponzi scheme and their deposits were essentially stolen by, by the leadership of the bank and, and political cronies. But what's also happened is that Afghanistan has crystallized into a brand new hub for money laundering. Um, basically what happened is in building a financial sector, which the international community helped to do, but not um, applying sufficient oversight, you got the development of a very sophisticated money laundering hub with SWIFT codes that are, you know, in alliance with places like Commerce Bank, and so on. So people might say, well, Hawala's, the traditional money transfer system, has always existed, and everyone knows how much cash gets carried out of Afghanistan in various ways every week. But you take it to another level of um, complexity when you give the money launderers um, swift codes. <laughs> so I would say that as we look forward, and as you'll see, I'm, I'm really focusing on this, on, on this sort of state development side of things, because that's what we're doing in this panel. Obviously, in question and answer, I'm delighted to entertain a discussion of what the impact of U.S. troop withdrawal and, and um, what the likelihood of either civil war or something else might be. But apart from those you know, sort of um, geostrategic issues, 
potential re-descent into civil war, re-Talibanization of Afghanistan. Um, this is what I see to be one of the real regional dangers that is posed by the Afghanistan that's going to be left behind. Now, there is a chance that these geostrategic dangers, the potential of meltdown into civil war, might be mitigated by this structure that I'm describing to you because, you know, criminal organizations really like to be able to continue to um, conduct crime. And there's a chance that you might get the sort of precarious stability that you saw in, let's say, um, Prohibition-era Chicago. Um, you know... Uh, there is a degree of stability to that, or the type of stability that existed at least in economic um, activity in the Balkans during, during the war there in the 1990s. Um, but I think that um, what we really have to get our heads around is that perhaps one of the most enduring legacies of the decade or so that we have spent, that the international community has spent intensively involved in Afghanistan, will be perhaps one of the purest forms the world has seen to date of a criminal state. And that means we better start thinking about how to mitigate the potential international security um, impacts of that. And that means thinking through what types of leverage exist in the international community or even within the U.S. arsenal. And that includes things like, you know, there is now a treasury designation similar to the, so you've got the narcotics kingpin designation, which allows for the, you know, a sanctions regime against individuals or groups that are considered, that are designated as narcotics kingpins. We now have a relatively new one about, you know, that focuses on international organized crime. And, you know, just again, within at least a U.S. government, it might be time to think about, are we going to need to add some prosecutors to that unit inside the Justice Department? And again, just to stick with Justice Department, there's a terrific tool that's called in rem forfeiture, which is a civil case against the proceeds of crime, meaning you can, if you, essentially, if you find a bag of money in the same room that you just found a bag of dope, you can um, you can attack the money, in a sense, in a civil suit for forfeiture, and you do not have to have, you have, you don't even, not only do you not have to have a convicted criminal, you don't even have to have a suspect. All you have to do is to be able to prove, or prove beyond uh, reasonable doubt, the association of this asset with this crime. That again, and, and, and so, and just about any asset that has existed in U.S. dollars is subject to this kind of a, a civil procedure. So I just think that as the United States government anyway looks forward to some of the risks that will have to be addressed, um, uh, it should think about how to mitigate the international security risks of a criminal organization supplied with swift codes and arable land. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. <laughs> Thank you very much for this rosy picture with the political <laughs> contrast with the view that we usually get about the transition. Uh, Chris, please, on in the side of the army and the court, Pakistan fragile democratic moment. Oh, please. Please. On. It's hard following you, woman. <laughs> She's my hero. Can I be your shawgird? All right, so after hearing um, about this fabulous uh, criminal state, Pakistan actually looks pretty good in comparison. <laughs> and then by the time we get to Bangladesh, I mean, we're just on this copiacetic trajectory of fabulousness. All right, so I'm going to talk about Pakistan. Um, the last couple of weeks, you know, there had been a lot of fear mongering that there was going to be a coup, which again put the the army back in the spotlight. And I, I never really know in audiences like this you know, how much sort of standard issue knowledge one should sort of take for granted. So let me just say very briefly that while the army generally takes the um, the the uh, the burden of Pakistan's decrepitude state of its democracy. In fact, the army never rules alone. It never has. It's unlikely that it ever will. Um, part of that's because 
while democracy is debated in Pakistan and it's never really fructified, authoritarianism doesn't really have legitimacy. So if you look at the way, you know, there's, I'm going to be somewhat glib and try to generalize across four coups, but, you know, they've, they've kind of followed the same playbook. I mean, I could probably write the, the next playbook of the next coup. There's going to be some sort of manufactured civil disturbance that usually involves some politician that can gain from having the parliament prorogued. When the army comes in, there is joyous applause because, thank goodness, the venal Kaminas are now out of power and the glorious army has come in to save them all. Um, the army then suspends the constitution. Of course, the army chief in doing so commits treason, but there's never been an army chief convicted of treason. Um, suspends the constitution, dismisses the national assembly, requires the justices to swear oath to whatever legal order they have propounded, of course, in violation of their prior oath to uphold the constitution, which has now been eviscerated. I may add that when democracy is eventually restored, there is never any punishments meted out to these people who have obviously broken their various commitments and, in fact, the law under Pakistan's constitution. The army steps out of power when it is no longer good for the army to be in the position of running the country. Um, the army is essentially a political institution. It cares a lot uh, what Pakistanis think about it. And when it judges that it's no longer good for it and its institution, it steps back and it allows an inevitably flawed uh, variant of democracy to take place. The problem is these coups last from seven to ten years, and in the interim, the political parties have become out of. Oh, I forgot one very important step. I can't believe I forgot this. I can't believe I forgot this. Um, because obviously, the army can't rule alone. Um, the army has to have a, a have a political accomplice. So after it has dismissed the National Assembly, after it's completely stacked the judiciary with people that are supportive of it, it eventually holds uh, flawed elections. And in preparation for the flawed elections, it cobbles together a king's party, which are largely venal politicians drawn from the existing parties who would rather be in power than not in power, as well as an opposition of choice, again, inevitably cobbled together from the Islamist parties. And the elections are held, and a weak coalition comes in with these Islamists always nipping at their ankles. And that's sort of how the playbook goes. Now, What's kind of interesting about our current situation is that Pakistan is on the, the precipice of, of actually a really important transition. This is going to be provided that, well, I'm, I'm a little bit less optimistic in my interpretation of how this whole Qadri affair wound down. But in principle, we're about to have the third time that there's been a constitutional transition of power. The, the first happened when the parliament that was elected in 2002 was elected out uh, giving way to the current government, and then the current government will give way to the next. Some people discount the first one because it happened under Musharraf's regime, but if I'm not mistaken, it was still the first parliament to serve out its term in entirety, even though they did so under Musharraf's um, guidance. So nonetheless, this is at a historic moment. So if you're the army, what are you primarily concerned about? When I look at what this particular government's been able to do, despite the, the industrial strength corruption, although I have to temper that after your presentation, it's, I mean, I'm not, it, it's, this is small business corruption compared to what Afghanistan is, is mired in. Despite all of the problems with the current PPP government, it's actually done a lot of things it doesn't get credit for because everyone is much more interested in chasing the terrorism story. What has it done? Well, it's actually done much to institutionalize the processes of democracy. It's actually been the most active National Assembly in doing what, what National Assemblies are supposed to do, which is actually legislating. Um, many Pakistani legislators don't like to legislate, uh, ironically enough. It's also... Um, done much with respect to devolution. So many of the, the problems in Baluchistan and Sindh and even in KPK stem from the over-centralized state. In addition to this, Zardari, despite all of his problems, is the only sitting president, and Marvin can correct me if I'm wrong, to actually sign away all of his presidential powers, right? So, I mean, all else equal, the PPP has actually done not a bad job. In addition to that, the National Assembly has inserted itself in discussions of national security and foreign policy in a way that I haven't seen in a very long time. Um, I have to go back a really long time before you saw the National Assembly um, being involved in this way. Now, of course, it's not done so in a way that's going to step on the toes of the army. I'm not being Panglossian here. But Pakistanis are now somewhat expecting their politicians to comment upon Pakistan's foreign relations. And I think that's a really important transition. So as, as Pakistan is beginning yet this potential third transition, what's the army worried about? Well, the army's worried about if the PPP comes back in or whatever government gets elected, 
it's going to make it ever more difficult for the Army to do what the Army likes to do, which is basically come in and run the show whenever it feel, feels as if Allah has tapped it on the shoulder and told it to do so, right? So if you're the Army, where, what are your sort of cards that you can play right now? It's pretty clear that the Army can't simply do another coup. All the, the polling data are pretty clear. Pakistanis don't want another coup. And as upset as they are with the various crises that continue to pummel Pakistan, there is no appetite to get rid of democracy. So even if the Army wanted to have a coup, and we could argue that perhaps it has been itching for several coups over several crises over the last several years, I think the Army's concluded that a coup is just not something it can do right now. So what I've seen... And, you know, this is, I put this out there as a theory. I'm interested in, you know, what, what, what people think. I see the court and the army operating in this really strange sort of synchrony. Now, the court has done some things to tick off the army. But when it's come to dealing with the PPP, they've been in synchrony in a way that just really befuddles the laws of probability, that this is all sheerly a coincidence. So, for example, let's, let's keep in mind that this particular Supreme Court justice hates the PPP, beholden to the PMLN. Why? Zardari didn't want to reinstate him after Musharraf ousted him. He feared that the Supreme Court justice would eviscerate the, the, um, the National Reconciliation Order, which allowed Zardari and other PP people to contest elections in the first instance. And it was, the prime, it was Nawaz Sharif's party, the PMLN, and the Long March joined with the, the lawyers' movement that finally brought the situation to a crisis that allowed Kiani to intervene and force a resolution to bring the Supreme Court justice back, right? So it's not a coincidence that when the Supreme Court justice goes after corrupt politicians, he's only going after the PPP. Now, anyone who knows about, you know, Milana Diesel or any of the PMLN fellows, you could certainly make the case, gee, there has to be some corruption underneath those shawars somewhere. But for some reason... Chowdhury Sahib only sees PPP corruption. You also see the PPP being most uh, fixated and vicious upon the PPP and um, its leadership when the army seems to have a bright-eyed boy in, in the side. So, for example, in 2011, 2012, when they went after Gilani, when they went after uh, Zardari, when they went after Haqqani, and, and the list goes on and on, who did you have in the wings? You had Imran Khan. But Imran Khan pretty much showed his cards pretty quickly, that he wasn't going to play in, which, in the way in which the Falji thought he might. And so his tsunami really quickly became a mud puddle. And the Supreme Court, oddly enough, began behaving itself. Uh, well, I don't want to say behaving itself because it was doing other things. But it decided that maybe its target wasn't the PPP. After all, to bring down the PPP without some sort of alternative, what are you left with? The PMLN. The Army's not all that fond of the PMLN either because of Nawaz Sharif's dalliance with trying to kill President Musharraf. I might add that's another positive sign in this current situation. Pakistani politicians are very adept at reinventing themselves, going back, placating, and, and rehabilitating themselves. If, if Nawaz Sharif wanted to, he could appease the army. He could have gone back and tried to re-ingratiate himself with the khakis. They would hate him far less than they hate Zardari. But what's interesting about Nawaz Sharif, whereas in the past he benefited from the cycle of aligning with the army, proroguing the parliament, getting re-elected through early elections, he actually has shown no interest in playing this game this time around. And I think that's really really important. It shows that at least the PMLN has learned the lesson that by allowing the army to be your tool to prorogue the government to give you short-term gains, short-term gains, it undermines Pakistan's democratic prospects. So I, I think that's a really important data point. So what is this Qadri fellow? So Qadri comes out of nowhere. Virtually no Pakistanis had heard of him. He had ties, of course, to Ziaul Haq. He obviously had ties to Musharraf. But he comes out of nowhere. He is festooned all over television. He's got wheat, you know, these wheat poster campaigns, or whatever you call them, um, in the United States. And all of a sudden, this guy can alight from Canada and find himself ensconced in a shahadit-proof container. You know, I talked to my Pakistani friends who live there. Could you go and procure for yourself a shahadit-proof container? Absolutely dumbfounding. No, of course the answer is no. So when I sort of think about is this, is this transition about to happen, you know, the Army has to sort of be licking its chops. What can it do given a very limit, limited opportunity space that it has at its disposal? So it brings Qadri. Qadri, by the way, amasses crowds that even the tsunami didn't amass, which obviously raises suspicions that maybe there's a khaki hand behind him in his shahadit-proof container. 
And he hangs out on Parliament uh, in, until he finally wrests concessions from an extra constitutional process from the PPP to declare an election date and to set up a caretaker government in consultation with a man who is a Canadian citizen. He's completely unelectable because he's not a Pakistani citizen and in consultation with the army. So everyone sort of sighed, um, sort of sigh of relief that this coup had in fact been avoided. But I'm a little bit more cynical in my read of this. I see that this is exactly the only card the army could play. Coup was never in the cards. The army can't pull it off. But what it could do is make the PPP look as disastrous as possible weaken it, make it look as if it cowed down to this extra constitutional fellow in a box. And then by the time elections go forward, it would potentially weaken their position at the ballot box. I, I anticipate that the PPP will still get a plurality, which no doubt irks the army. It may even it may even get a slight majority. I don't know. But if you're the army, what you could hope for is that it gets the minimum votes possible, subject to what you can do with without um, industrial strength rigging that, that might cause the international community to go insane, but to come into power in a weak coalition kind of like it did in 2008. Remember when it came in coalition with PMLN, they sort of had a falling out over the Chief Justice Chowdhury. And should this government fail or fall and not be able to resurrect itself with new partners, this isn't going to be the Army's fault. But what the Army's been able to do by propping up, you know, the, the uh, cadre in a box demonstrates that it still has the ability to keep democracy on Pakistan's leash, which defers, at least for the time being, the possibility that the politicians through practicing of democracy will eventually be able to put the collar on the Army. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Anyway, last speaker, please, Manisa, for an intervention of Sindh the father. You'll have to explain who the father is, <laughs> and the origin, future, and implication of Bangladesh governance. <laughs> who the father is, well, father of the nation, father of the opposition, my own father. Um, so I'm really proud to be the only South Asian woman who has spoken today. Um, I was a little bit disheartened to see an article outside that dismisses Bangladesh's growth as a myth. Um, I don't think it's a myth, but do stop me if I paint a rosy picture of Bangladesh, because I went home after 15 months, and on January 1st when I landed in Bangladesh, I was thrilled to see the visible progress. There were new flyovers that I hadn't seen in the... I was living there about three years ago. Of course, I knew about the usual suspects, the power outages, the traffic jams, there's no health care in case my kids get sick, um, political instability, opposition leaders disappearing, a war crimes tribunal gone awry, garments infernos, the two battling ladies continuing to rip our country apart. And yet, ultimately, a country has both visible and invisible structures and there are definitely improvements in the infrastructure of Bangladesh that can be credited to the government of Sheikh Hasina, and this reflects a thriving economy. More than anything, as a citizen of Bangladesh, I felt a boost for my morale, and you could actually feel citizens being more confident. People who can feel the physical structures improve are more inclined to contribute to the in invisible infrastructure once the physical, thing, the visible structures are there. And of course, we've heard here in Washington, D.C. about the huge corruption scandal in Bangladesh that allowed the World Bank not to finance a huge bridge, the Padma Bridge in Bangladesh. But instead of focusing on this one failure for Bangladesh, I thought of all the hundreds of bridges that we don't hear about that have been completed. In Bangladesh, while it has grown at 6%, indeed it can grow at 8 to 10%, and that's the kind of... Um, growth that we need. But when I saw that I was on a panel with Pakistan and Afghanistan, and of course we've got lots of the problems of Afghanistan, many of the problems of pa Pakistan, I assumed that I was going to have to talk about radicalization <laughs> in Bangladesh, because this is what I've written about in the past. And while radicalization in Bangladesh cannot be ignored, it's not our core problem, it's a symptom because radicalization thrives on weak, invisible structures where there's weak governance. 
and weak governance fosters both political and cultural radicalization. So let me go ahead and quickly define political radicalization as the rejection of the political order as illegitimate, which an Islamist party would do, naturally. And political radicalization would thrive on the cultural radicalization. So I'll define cultural radicalization as where the society becomes less and less tolerant and more dogmatic. Um, cultural radicalization in Bangladesh is connected to the growing global radicalization and politicization of Islam. But in Bangladesh, this is milder because milder than in most um, Muslim-majority countries, mostly because of the deeply rooted Bengali culture and an Islam that has served the spiritual needs of Bangladesh for many centuries, or the area for many centuries. So Bangladesh is an acute case of what happens elsewhere when excluded youth often feel refuge in radical ideas. So the real issue here in Bangladesh is governance reform, because we've got what we have in Bangladesh the New York Times is called as the cheapest place under the sun, and then we've got young, youthful um, labor force. So it really is a matter of putting this combination to right use. Of course, corruption remains a growing concern, and it's tolerated at every level of society. It's exhausting because it's worsening as the dividends of our growth are not being uh, fairly distributed, and the trends towards authoritarianism is increasing, and it's raising uh, louder voices. And yet, the current state of Bangladesh gets a passing grade from the international community and first and foremost from India. India can serve as Bangladesh's biggest ally or, as, or its greatest impediment. In Bangladesh's foreign policy, there is nothing more important than Bangladesh's relationship with India. There's no potential greater support for Bangladesh's progress and prosperity than our giant neighbor. And yet, this relationship is extremely asymmetrical because Bangladesh was supposed to be a basket case and India is a superpower. And yet, Bangladesh is not an ins insignificant factor for India. Um, it can be a regional asset in the northeast where the Seven Sisters are, or in South Asia, or in the world. Or it can be a major source of trouble for India. And here, there can be no middle ground. And the reason for the no middle ground is that Bangladesh cannot be neutralized in India's foreign policy. India can either properly absorb Bangladesh into an Indian order, or India will have to clash with Bangladesh. It's 160 to 165 million people that are already, already bursting in Bangladesh's seams with the limitations of our borders. Bangladesh can't just be a market or a fenced-in ally. It also has to be... India has to recognize our internal demographic pressure in our marketplace and the parity as we negotiate. For example, whether it's water sharing treaties or tariff treaties, many of these agreements are made in secret. And more and more, the Bangladeshi citizen is aware and is demanding more transparency. So the strategic challenges for governance in Bangladesh today is in rationalizing and harmonizing our relationship with India, in that we want to be a strong partner with India, but not a vassal state. And then managing Bangladesh's prosperity, it'll need to do a better job in managing its uh, social discontent and instability, such as workers' conditions and labor unions and so on. And of course, the tolerance for corruption. So the two um, structural deficits that I see looming over Bangladesh is mistaking autocracy for governance. For instance, while the parliamentary system is, uh, exists in principle, it's blatantly autocratic in practice. The Bangladeshi citizen votes, but she doesn't really experience a democratic choice in the local, in her locality, in division or national election, and certainly not in her party affiliation. Because once the majority, once the majority wins in parliament, there's no voice for the minority, because usually the opposition is boycotting parliament. And there's 100% control over whoever uh, the winner is. It's winner take all. All of these are the usual stories um, that you hear about Bangladesh. And also within the structural deficits is the fight over uh, the versions of history, uh, who is the father and who is the founder, and this whole argument that distracts more than anything else from the country's great potential. So in conclusion, Bangladesh is a complex society. Um, in all three levels, um, there are vested interests that don't want us to get ahead. For instance, at the local level, the local thug will not let changes happen. And then at the crony appointee will, 
uh, block the changes at the provincial level. And then at the inner circle, the changes will be blocked at the national level. And naturally, the established political parties won't let us make changes at the internal level to let go of control of the country. However, there are large segments now of the educated youth that are yearning for more. Um, and here I am <laughs> representing them, I hope. Um, there's a democratic space that offers the possibility of a third party emerging. And true, this has been tried and failed and tested before, but it remains the most cautious and most promising path. I think that creating a transparent third party with a good governance practice remains the most attractive and potentially the most contagious approach to breaking the current deadlock. Thank you very much, Melissa. Well, thank you for all our three speakers. I mean, we see at the same time uh, situations where, again, the democratic issue is very much a uh, very much a question still today. At the same time, various uh, various situation, and on the question of governance, various degrees of achievement or non-achievements. And if we look at the past of all these three countries, this has never been a linear come linear process. Sorry, from one low level to a slightly uh, higher level or the opposite. This is something which is going up and down all the time. So this is difficult to, from what has been said and what has been written so far, to define any. Uh, any uh, future with any sort of relevance. We now have some minutes for a, a question and answer session. You all know the rules. Please introduce yourself, ask your question, and then we'll go to the panel. Who would like to start? Yes, please, sir. Yashodhan uh, Ghorpade from the Institute of Development Studies in the UK. My question to you, Dr. Fair. Uh, in spite of what you said, I picked up a very sort of almost optimistic note in uh, what you say about Pakistan. And uh, it, if you would indulge me, it's only because I feel in spite of everything that the court and the army have tried to do, the government has head-on sort of and met these challenges uh, quite directly, uh, whether it was uh, the letter-writing case or uh, standing up to uh, this man in the box. And I just wonder the next time around, if in fact the government is re-elected or manages a ragtag coalition, doesn't it exhaust all the options uh, of uh, the army to displace them? Uh, and they would only have to be extremely creative to find uh, ways to try and dislodge an elected government. So isn't this a good precedent, you think? Chris, yes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's what I said, right? <laughs> that's why I think you know, the army, there's a lot, there's a lot hanging um, from the Army's point of view on this transition, anything they can do to dent it, to render its full constitutional nature is to its advantage. I think the most important thing is that Nawaz Sharif has learned this lesson that cooperating with the Army to prorogue the government to bring about earlier elections is not good for him or anyone else. I don't know if the PPP has learned this lesson. So if we were to sort of imagine, and I don't, I don't think the numbers are there, um, if the, if the PMLN were to be the ones that form the government by some hook or by crook, I don't know if the PPP has learned the lesson that it's best to serve your term out rather than connive with the army. We don't know. We won't know until it happens. But it, obviously, it takes both of these primary uh, parties to, to have that, that patience. But I, I think... I'm this, thinking, this is the one... <laughs> you know, I don't want to say, I didn't mention terrorism once in Pakistan. If, if Pakistan could somehow get this terrorism monkey off its back, I mean, it squandered an entire decade by not doing so. There's absolutely no reason why Pakistan has to be the basket case that it is today, right? Politicians choose to not raise the taxes upon themselves. There's a lot of similarities between our politicians and theirs. But, you know, there's a, there's a lot of potential in Pakistan. It, it chooses every time to make really bad decisions. But I think we would be really remiss if we, if we didn't acknowledge that the last several years has really been important for the consolidation of democracy. I'm not being Panglossian. This, this, no, nothing that's happened is irreversible, which is why this next transition is absolutely important. But, but I, I think this is the positive part of Pakistan that we haven't seen or we haven't discussed in forums like this in D.C. for a very long time. Chris, perhaps to continue on this question with an, another question to you, I mean, I mean, and to play the devil advocate to the extent that the devil needs an advocate, uh, <laughs> I mean, can't you see also a situation where the army, as you said, is no longer able to impose its will, but continues to uh, systematically erode the, the, the legitimacy uh, of the party which is in power, which 
already don't need that, but I mean, in creating a situation which become uh, simply unsustainable because the political party will not have the desired legitimacy and the army will not have the kind of power it did enjoy in the past. Well, I, actually, that was my read of what this whole this whole Qadri fiasco is. So, I mean, we'll have to sort of we'll have to see what happens after the elections. But my sense is the army knows it can't have a coup. It wanted to weaken the PPP as far as possible. Actually, that's down. That's a, a huge problem. That, that, that's a huge strategy for the army to play. Why? What Pakistan really needs is to sort of deal with some of its legislative issues. So, for example, to go back to the terrorism problem, it has the same issue of India, it, it, the same issue as India, right, with, it, with POTA, TATA. Um, there has not been a permanent change to the penal code that allows them to, say, for example, prosecute terrorists or even change the evidentiary standard. This is just one policy issue. And the only way you can get that to happen is by having political strength. Another issue, police reform. Police reform, as, as you know, we've been following this, this for years. Um, the only way you're going to get police reform, which is so necessary for Pakistan's law and order, is to actually have a relatively robust uh, political constituency that can sort of, yes, the short-term losses are you no longer have the police to be your, your, your loyal ruffian, but the long-term benefit of that is that you actually have a Pakistan that's more livable. And I can go through several of these, this public service reform, tax reform. So what, what I see the Army's done here is it's, it's basically made a move that benefits its very short-term interests. But as always, it's put the long-term interests of the country in abeyance. I will say one thing about the Army. Um, I, I, th I think I've posted this on Social Science Research Network. I'm not sure. So... I've been looking a lot, as some of you know, at the changing demographics of the Pakistan army. They've been, and here's another success story of the army, despite everything, they've done a very good job of expanding the recruitment base. I mean, they're going into Bluchistan, they're going into Sindh. Now, I then began crosswalking this with my survey data about attitudes. It turns out that things about Kashmir, for example, the belief that um, Kashmiris want to join Pakistan, support for militant Islam, that's obviously the strongest in the Punjab. And so there's an interesting trade-off that's happening in the successive cohorts of the Pakistan army that are not coming from the Punjab. If you, The attitudes that these folks have in Baluchistan and Sindh and KPK is really quite different. And so if we kind of play this out, the sort of slow changes that continue to evolve as the Pakistan Army's demographic base changes, the Army may have be a completely different Army, say, in 50 years from now. So you know, when we sort of look at the trajectory of civil-military relations, I'm very keen to look at the compounding effects of the way in which the Army's changing its demography. It's it is absolutely indisputable that this is going on. What the consequences of that are are still very much an empirical question, but the signs look good on the kinds of things that Americans care about, which is support for jihad, <laughs> attitudes towards India, um, resort of force as a legitimate way of resolving outstanding disputes and so forth. Thank you. Next question, please. Yes, Neil. Thank you. A uh, question for Sarah. The Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction issued a fairly um, bleak report on the Afghan National Security Forces. Um, I wonder what you think about the prospects for ANSF uh, in this criminal state that you foresee. Um, I, I think that the debate in uh, the United States has focused, it, you know, and it almost got focused as a, a policy decision was made to say that our best ticket out was a robust professional NSF that tended to sort of channel interest in Washington and in the United States on the sort of specifics of how the NSF is performing. Before I even get to that question, I, I actually think that it's not that your question is erroneously, thank you, we keep doing this. You know why it is? It's because the green light looks like it's on because we've got lights reflecting in. That's, that's the issue. Sorry. So I, I actually think the way this whole debate has been channeled um, kind of ig ignores a bigger picture. And if I, if I may, I'd like to use a metaphor. An army or security forces are sort of like an arm or a tool. You can take that arm to the gym. 
and you can exercise it and you can bulk up its muscles and you can increase its, you know, agility and you can give it some brass knuckles. But if the body to which that arm is non-viable, uh, sorry, if the body to which that arm is attached is non-viable, then it almost doesn't matter how functional the arm is in terms of that arm's ability to defend the body. And I kind of think that's the situation that we're in. If, it, you know, if you're looking at the structure whose interest is not, the, the interest of the structure is not in governing or protecting Afghanistan as a state. Its interest in or its objective is to extract resources. That's going to affect um, the capacity, capability, and functionality of the ANSF. Um, and so I think what is more almost more useful than thinking about how well will the ANSF be able to defend against Taliban incursion would be to start thinking through how will these criminal organizations make use of the parts of the ANSF to which they have access. What I did see was a significant, so, okay, so that's one part of an answer, which, which has to do with the framework that I presented before. But in a more traditional tra framework that would have to do with the political groupings and, and breakouts of this country, um, I think it's not only important to look at the military capabilities of the ANSF, um, but also the networking of it. And this was something that we didn't get very good at. So we, we got to a point where we would talk about the Pashtun balance. You know, there, there aren't enough Pashtuns in the army. And then we got a little bit better. We would say, well, actually, now we've got representationally enough Pashtuns, but they're not coming from the south. So they're regionally imbalanced. What we never got accurate enough in examining was what, what are the networked affiliations of those Pashtuns that are in the army? Um, and so I think what we would have found, particularly in the mid to high level officer corps, is that in fact most of the Pashtuns that were actually in the army were affiliated with the Northern Alliance. And so functionally they will not, they, 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 they don't count as Pashtuns in a funny way, um, or they don't count as a unifying force. And so what was very interesting, and I made a, an inaccurate prediction a while ago, but was, what was very interesting was to watch the career of Bismillah Khan, who's now the Minister of Defense. He was Chief of Staff of the Army and did a very good job of inserting precisely these Northern Alliance-affiliated officers, particularly in the mid-level you know, battalions and brigades. Um, then he went to the police. Uh, and started rapidly structuring the police along these types of lines also, particularly in the north, because the army is largely deployed, not in the north. So you've got police that starts to function as a kind of army in the north. Um, and in fact, even the geographic uh, boundaries of the zones he changed in order to create a kind of non um, a, a unified non-Pashtun front in the north. And so I think rather than military capability, on the one hand you can say Afghans over the years have proven that they've got pretty good military capability one way or another, hook or crook, well, you know, whether it looks like a capable security force as we understand that, they've done fairly well over the past. I think what's uh, more important to try to figure out is how is that capability going to break out along the lines either of a sort of strategic political potential breakdown between a resurgent Taliban or a um, peace deal invited in Taliban to the south and east versus a more anti-Taliban north uh, and west on the one hand or in terms of this criminal organization. Thank you, Sarah. Next question? Yes, please, Sarah. Uh, Brian Hedrick from the National Intelligence Council. This is for uh, Maniza, but anybody's also welcome to, to comment. A um, couple, of, couple of points on Bangladesh I'd just like to ask. Uh, one, um, I'd just like to hear your thoughts on how has Bangladesh managed to sort of get themselves out of the coup trap? So we've seen a, a number of successive elections now in Bangladesh, that is, you know, and so they, they seem to have gotten that right. Uh, understand there's a little bit of a difficulty between with the last election, but that really wasn't a coup per se. Um, and then the second question is, uh, we're stuck with the two Begums probably for at least a little while longer, but dynastic succession within the parties, which seems to be the norm in South Asia, 
um, is a little bit questionable. And so what, is, what do you think the impact of that is going to be? And you mentioned a third front in your speech. Uh, is the third front sort of, is that the window of opportunity uh, as the dynastic succession begins to fall apart? Because one, one party seems unwilling and the other party is just a lot worse than, the, than his mother. Um, so I'd just like to see your, hear your thoughts on that as well. Thank you. I don't know if we're out of a coup trap, I guess, because our last coup with the, mili with the civilian facade just didn't work out. It almost tainted our most respectable institution, which was our military. Um, the interesting thing in Bangladesh is that we're almost a rentier state. The military is not really accountable to the country because most of its income comes from the UN. Um, and so it was just such a terrible experience with the military because now we wonder if they stole more than the politicians would have. So we're not going down that path. Um, dynastic politics, it's not over. You know, there's Hasina, there's her sister, might be her son or the sister's son, there's her daughter as well. Um, and yet, I don't think Bangladeshis are at all interested in having the revenge that another, you know, you've got one Begum now and she's doing bad stuff, sure, but we're not interested in the revenge of the other one coming in, I guess. Maybe she will come in. We'll see. Um, the, why, I'm not sure we're out of the coup trap, which is why developing this third, um, third alternative as a model is it's a discussion that's on the ground right now, you know, because you can pull people from Bangladeshi politicians have always switched from Awami League to BNP. So why not pull from both of the parties and make a third and then have these guys set a trend? And it would, they could easily win, I don't know, 100, a couple, couple of seats in parliament. You know, It's challenging. It's definitely not easy. Uh, but there's just such a dynamic youth over there. I mean, this time when I went back, they introduced local Bangladeshis to members of the Bangladeshi American diaspora that there's a lot of reverse migration going on, accountants, lawyers, health workers that want to come back to Bangladesh. Um, I don't know if it's because we le read a lot of Tagore and are just romantic in our outlook. Um, and we've got, it's not that we don't have our Ponzi schemes. We're learning fast from the Afghans, you know. We're quick. <laughs> We're taking suitcases of cash out of the country as well. Um, we've got the RSEC um, or the American SEC training our stock market guys how to how to steal, how to catch, how to punish. You know, we're doing stuff. Um, and I feel the need to address the garments issue because, you know, it's easy for us to say, oh, let's punish them. They haven't cooperated and it's been two years. We're demanding better changes. But, f and I don't want to normalize the situation at all. However, there's a planning situation in Bangladesh. You know, I went to the dinner with Ansan Suki over here, and she said, don't give me the best laws, give me lawyers. Mm -hmm. So, and I, it just struck with me a lot, because I went to law school in the United States thinking I'm going to go back to Bangladesh and make things better, because everyone else was studying law in the UK. Um, so it's just a matter of learning how to plan and then implement the plan. And so with these young people, for instance, you know, how do we make a political structure that would work? Um, because right now you've got to, if you want to be a leader in one of those parties, you've got to just stick around somebody's party office until they pick up on you. And that's not, I don't have time for that. <laughs> just to say, just before we take the next question, just to stay for a minute on Bangladesh. Can you elaborate a little bit on this movement, the youth, the, I mean, and, and, and on the larger issue of, of uh, uh, the democratic culture? I mean, in Pakistan, for example, beyond the movement that Chris was describing, we've seen also at the, at the grassroots level, the political parties trying to set up some roots, getting, uh, becoming a really grassroots party. With various degrees of success, with various intensity, and so on. And it's probably premature to say that this has achieved any results so far, but this is a movement that could be observed. Is there anything similar in Bangladesh? I mean, below dynastic politics, is there something that can be observed that could, or not, lead to something else in a few years from now? I could be absolutely wrong. Maybe there is a coup in the plan. I mean, this next election in Bangladesh is so up for grabs. I mean, um, it's, 
I like what the Prime Minister right now is doing, but she's a little bit despotic in her ways. Um, but maybe the benevolent dictator is the way to go. What I absolutely love about the culture of the youth in Bangladesh are, for instance, when I was back this time, there was a vagina monologue being performed at the local, you know, a local version of it. Um, there's so much excitement over the one billion rising movement coming up on Valentine's Day. Um, you just really feel good vibes when I'm there, maybe because I have the privilege of not living there right now. Um, so it's nice to go back as a visitor. Um, I don't know what the difference is. Attitude? A lot of our industries are women-based, you know, whether it's the garments or the microfinance or it's been 20 years or... I mean, 40 years of a country, but 20 years of these women leading us crazy you know, in many ways. And yet, I'm not impatient with uh, our change. I've seen what the military does. This is what I wrote about. You know, Let us have messy democracies for years until we uh, fix our institution. We had the benefit of the wonderful Pakistani civil service, which we no longer do. Um, so we've really got to work on give, getting better education um, we don't have an IIT, you know, we're, we're exporting laborers, migrant workers into the Middle East without any formal training. So if you could train these people just a little bit more, the um, results would be fantastic. So I guess it's just attitude. Next question, please. Yes, madam. Thank you. I'm Jinning Wen with Voice of Vietnamese Americans. I share all of your stories because I think Vietnam has all of that factors. I think it depends on where you capitalize the factors. And, and I can see that Manisa has a very positive view of Bangladesh, while you have a very uh, you know, pessimistic view of Afghanistan. But with the history of Vietnam, we very much wish that Afghanistan would be successful in this transitional process. So I would like to ask you to point out the positive facts that we have achieved. Because personally, I have friends who have been in Afghanistan within the last 10 years periodically and working for USAID and helping at the high levels. He's helping the Ministry of Agriculture. He's helping different levels to help setting up or starting good governance he helped to somehow organize how to make it more transparent, follow the accountants, and how to make sure that the money gets to the grassroots level. And I also have friends now working to build up civil societies, getting to the people and ask them to how to form um, the ideas of elections and things like that, voting and things like that. And I've heard from them when they came back, like after four years, after five years, after 10 years, they did tell us that there are change, uh, there are improvements that, that are noticeable. So I know there's negative effect, there's positive approach that we have seen. And I very much hope that the US and the international con um, community would take this time and help Afghanistan more to so that to build a stronger institutions, because this is very crucial for the South Asia area, for India, for Pakistan, and for the whole regional as far as, as also global security and peace. So I, I don't want to see Afghanistan to suffer what Vietnam has gone through since 1975 till now. This is a crucial time. If you project a very sad image and very hopeless, I guess that does affect the donors and people who want to help. But there's many ways to help. And I, I like what you said about education and the third parties and the young generations. So would you tell us exactly a few positive points and where we can actually invest in it to build up the young generations? Yeah, uh, I really appreciate what you said. And I appreciate also you speaking from a Vietnamese perspective because um, Sometimes when I refer to Vietnam, and I was, um, you know, very young when the United States withdrew from Vietnam, but I think there are, and, and I wish I had been more conscious so I could better understand. Sorry. sorry. I wish I could be more conscious so I could better understand um, precisely what the 
accurate dimensions of the parallel are. But I have to say, um, and, and I think there are some, and I think they're not very happy ones. And I have to say, and, and I spent 10 years of my life in Afghanistan. Um, that 10 years was driven by hope and often by hope springing eternal. There were some turning, I mean, I had turning points that should have told me this is hopeless, and then I would come up with a reason to convince myself that it was still possible. So I'm sorry that you're not going to be very successful in, in, in deflecting me from this position because it comes out of experience, and it comes out of experience at every level. And in particular, I think where I may diverge from your colleagues is I lived in the population in Kandahar. So what I'm telling you is the perspective of ordinary Afghans. Um, but here is where, so what I'm often told with respect to Vietnam is look at Vietnam today. And I say, okay, but look at the cost to Vietnam to get where it is today. I mean, thrilled that Vietnam is where it is today, given where it was in 1975, but did it have to cost that much? And were we, as Americans who were responsible for what happened to Vietnam, were we conscious of what the impact was of the way we left Vietnam? And I have to say that having been, so I kind of have ended my trajectory heavily focused on, on um, Afghanistan in the U.S. government. And what I'm sensing today is something Americans know how to do very well, which is turn the page. And we turned the page on Vietnam. When we decided we're leaving, we were done. And the impact on the Vietnamese population of how we left, we didn't care. And frankly, that's what I experience in the American psyche today. And I'd just like to finish by saying, although I think that's a terrible fact, um, and I have an issue dealing with, I mean, I've got friends. What's going to happen to them? And so you have you know, a lot of personal issues to, to, to address in this respect. But the other thing I would like to say is, although I don't think turning the page is the right thing for the United States to do as an international leader. By the same token, I don't think continuing to channel money and focus on a country in the framework of a broken and failed policy is the way to do it either. So short of really re, uh, almost like a, like a kaleidoscope where you turn the, kaleidoscope and the image turns inside out, short of doing that to our policy, and by that I don't mean more troops for longer, I mean looking at the political dimensions of our policy in a very different way, short of doing that, I don't think the United States should continue, or donors should continue putting money into Afghanistan, or troops, or lives. And so it's a very complex issue that you raise. Just to stay on that for a second, uh, can you... Did we not want to be using... We'll come, back, we'll come back to that. Just to stay on that question for a second, uh, do you see any possibility to salvage whatever exists in the political system? Not, not in its current form. Of course, you described the Liberal Criminal Organization, but something that would be sufficient to ensure a minimum of functionality within uh, an Afghan state left to itself. I think there are, I think in the abstract, there are two sort of um, prongs of a very different U.S. political approach to both Afghanistan and Pakistan that could, in the abstract, um, potentially produce a different outcome. Um, and what I would like to preface that the answer with is a thought just for all of us who are American citizens and or concerned with how the United States um, projects its influence and power abroad, there's been a lot of debate in Washington about, you know, whether, for example, civilians like the Department of State gave in too easily to the military about, you know, how many troops there ought to be and maybe there should have been less troops. What we haven't really focused on as an international security community is the void of strategic thinking on the part of senior U.S. civilians. So what happened throughout this debate was let's think about different permutations and combinations of military solutions to the Afghanistan problem. And as we move forward as a country, we have got, I believe, that we've got to re-energize 
um, the non-military elements of U.S. power, and that doesn't just mean sending more district support teams or having a more expeditionary diplomacy, although I believe that needs to happen. It also has to do with thinking and taking more risk in terms of choosing political um, approaches to national security, um, national security problems. So in the case of Afghanistan, I think there are two things that we could do. With respect to Pakistan, almost reverse what we've been doing, which is to say, raise the cost of, of the Pakistani military's decision to instrumentalize violent extremism as, as a way of gaining its, um, its national security agenda. Raise the cost through very smart and very um, subtle types of sanctioning mechanisms, including international ones, which is one that you like to focus on, Frederic. Um, but there's a whole panoply of leverage that we could could apply to make it harder for Pakistan to um, foment or, or, or instrumentalize these um, extremist groups. And on the other hand, recognize that, the, that Pakistan does have a certain number of legitimate national security interests as concerns Afghanistan and open and reinforce the formal diplomatic channels for identifying and addressing those problems. So that's on the Pakistan side. And on the Afghanistan side, I think the problem that we have faced is as we've started to think of a, quote, political solution, which in in Washington speak has meant negotiating with the Taliban, it's been a very narrow aperture. And so we've looked at, you know, U.S. and or Karzai government interaction with the Taliban, period, as political settlement, whereas it turns out that there's a very diverse group of, um, dis, uh, of uh, disgruntled constituencies inside Afghanistan that are effectively excluded from the political process, from the, sorry, electoral process, because the electoral process is, is so heavily fraudulent. And so they don't have any means of um, influencing political outcomes in the country, and they're excluded from the nego negotiation process because they had the decency to not take up arms. So the question is, how could we broaden the aperture of this, um, of this reconciliation process um, to include not just representatives of the Taliban, but also representatives of other constituencies who have really legitimate grievances with the way the Karzai government has, has conducted itself and also with some of the structural arrangements um, that were built into the Afghan constitution. Um, this was on, uh, wasn't it on, um, what are the positive... Wasn't it, what are the positive... Um, I thought my presentation led to the question. Um, so for youth, so you want me to address youth in Bangladesh? I mean, there's so m Yeah. Right. It's a positive side. Right. <laughs> okay. Yes, madam, please. And then next. Um, so yes, I had one more question on Bangladesh. I was wondering if you, um, Ms. Hussain, could speak a little bit about the possibility of a caretaker government stepping in for the next election and whether you think that would be a good or bad thing for, uh, for the country. Yeah, um, absolutely. I am a big supporter of the caretaker system. Um, it's unfortunate that I believe the prime minister has scrapped it <laughs> right now, but I'm sure that this is going to be a huge uh, issue and hopefully she'll listen to the opposition and put it back because otherwise there is no reason for the opposition to want to be in the elections. So if the Awami League were to participate in the elections on their own with a couple of the other smaller political parties, then the question becomes how long will that parliament last? Um, so I think we should put, continue to put pressure on making sure that the caretaker system is reinstalled before uh, the elections the do take place. I hope so, but I think it's a great system. I can't remember if we came up with it or someone taught us. I, I think I've, <laughs> I think I've heard that we came up with it. So I'm not. I wish, uh, I wish it the best. I hope it comes back into place. It's a nice system so that you have a neutral, you know, a neutral administration watching over the elections. But manipulation, they know the machinery, so it's gonna. There's a good chance it'll happen anyway. But I hope the caretaker government system is put back. Since this is a session differentiated trajectory, it's interesting to know that the 
Your Baker system has disappeared in Bangladesh, but it has finally appeared in Pakistan. <laughs> and I won't go any further than that. Please, Madam over there. Um, firstly, I want to thank you all for this uh, wonderful evening. Um, secondly, um, it's nice to see women, uh, three women on this panel. Um, my question is to throw India in the mix, and I would like to know what each of you think of the potential role India can play um, with three countries involved here. Thank you. Wow. As in, um, I'm curious as to know if, um, you know, if, uh, for instance, for Bangladesh, uh, you know, there's the trilateral roadway which is coming up. Um, you know, there's a lot India is doing for Bangladesh. Um, I'd like to know your criticism or what you think about that. Or for Pakistan and Bangladesh, if, uh, I mean, sorry, for Afghanistan, if uh, the Indian army can in some ways, you know, help out um, the government. In what... I'm, Sorry. I'm just curious to know if you think that there's a positive, sorry, I'm getting nervous, there's a positive role India can play um, in the subcontinent. Thank you. May, may I suggest that we take perhaps the last question with it, and our panelists will wrap up on, on this very broad question. Please, sir, over there. Sir. Thank you. So the foundation of Pakistan, the word comes PAK, Punjab, Afghanistan, and Kashmir. What are the chances they're going to leave these ambition, the ambition to make a pan-Islamic state in the region, and they just, I mean, they would just saturate in their own territories? What are the chances? Thank you. Okay, on those two questions, we'll ask our families to, uh, to respond. Uh, starting with Bangladesh, perhaps? Yes, I'll go first. Sure. Um, I love the Indian presence in Bangladesh, the cultural, the television, the clothes, the food, everything. Um, I wish the negotiations were not so secretive, um, but I understand absolutely that in the culture of Bangladesh's sovereignty, it's not fashionable to say you're so pro-Indian outright. You have to just be more savvy about it. Um, so as long as you know we get our proper representation, but in many ways I blame our negotiation skills to that. I don't really think India should be throwing free cookies out at us. Um, so once we strengthen our, um, our ability to negotiate for our rights, I think we'll have better opportunity to be equal partners. Um, because right now, obviously, it's such a, I mean, it's, it's a province almost fighting with a superpower. Um, I do look forward to strengthening our own negotiation skills. And at the same time, um, I think India, yeah, in, it's all about India. I mean, we're surrounded everywhere th on India. So, um, federal, you know, if we be, whether Bangladesh aims at becoming, uh, f we have to have a federal kind of relationship in the future with India just to make sure trade and everything goes the way we want it to. Chris, I don't know under which angle you want to take the question. This is extremely broad. You can probably make a seminar just by yourself on this. So please try to restrict yourself a little bit. I will. So I'm going to be blunt on this whole India thing with Pakistan. India doesn't care about Pakistan if it weren't sending jihadis to blow up Indians. So, you know, if, if Pakistan could somehow, and this ties into the second question about the two-nation theory, and the way in which Pakistan views itself in terms of its national identity vis-a-vis -vis the Indians, you could really imagine a different scenario. I mean, I, I mean, you know, the Indians granted Pakistan MFN status, I believe, in 1996. You know, the Pakistanis figured out in 2011. So, you know, on the bilateral issue, I don't, you just cannot talk about that without the realities of the terrorism issue. And I'm, and I'm not sanguine that Pakistan is ever going to give up the jihad habit going to the second point, which I'll return to in a second. But there are lessons that Pakistan could learn from India if it were to um, be a little bit humble about it, because of course, you know, Pakistanis have particular views about India. So for example, India has rolled out a lot of e-governance campaigns. And what's interesting about e-governance it's successful where the patronage is small, where the patronage is big patronage, right? Where they're making money off of big deals, like, I don't know, railways, where people are not making their money off of the petty patronage, like land deeds, birth certificates, and so forth. So when you look at the way in which e-governance has been rolled out in India, it's receptive where, oddly enough, there's there's a, a corruption at the high level, but not at the low level. And so e, for many things that Pakistanis have to do every day, it's it's a rigmarole. I'll, you know, when people who have 
reservedly supported the Pak Talib is because of basic stuff like, oh yeah, um, the the local uh, political agent made me pay a fine or a bribe, excuse me, to get my mother's Nadra card. Um, the Pak Talib sent a chit and obviated the fine. So I think there are a lot of things that they can learn. The Pakistanis can learn a lot about how do you manage coalitions. I mean, what I think is really promising about India is that really the the relocation of the center of power from these large national powers to increasingly bringing these state-based powers into the play. Pakistan, with the exception of the PVP, doesn't have a national party that aggregates interest. So how do you get around that? Well, by bringing in these, these more local parties, but in a way that, that you do so on the basis of coalition building, not just, you know, um, loot, loot splitting. So I think Pakistan can learn a lot from India um, for a number of reasons. But I'm going to go back to the pan-Islamism. This is... This is, you know, I so wish you hadn't asked this because, you know, I could have just ended on a somewhat positive note. Here's Pakistan's basic dilemma. The entire problem of founding Pakistan resided on the two-nation theory, right? The problem with Jinnah's concept was the very people who believed in the concept, and by the way, people may not realize this, this notion of an independent Pakistan was very late to the game. For much of the Muslim League's history, Two-nation theory was about securing political rights for Muslims within united India. So this whole partition thing was, was a late arrival to the party. Where it had its sway was in the united provinces, where they were most acute um, in feeling the, the fears of a Hindu majority. Ironically, the part that became Pakistan today had no interest in the two-nation theory. And so once Pakistan became a reality... The two-nation theory was a liability, right? Because you're saying we're found on the basis of Islam, but over in East Pakistan, 20% of my population is Hindu, as well as a large communal minority on the other side. But yet to give up the two-nation theory would to basically give up one of the, the, the founding logics of Pakistan's claim to Kashmir, the so-called K in Pakistan. Um, so unfortunately, the way in which the two-nation theory has been operationalized is the ideology of Pakistan, which the army itself has embraced, when it discusses India, it discusses India as a nemesis in civilizational terms. And there is no compromise with a foe that views you in civilizational terms. So it's, if you kind of go through and you walk through what are the necessary but insufficient conditions for Pakistan to be at peace with itself and with its neighbors, first it has to be civilian control of the army. By the way, a diminishing uh, probability going towards zero at that asymptote. But let's pretend that that does happen. Let's suspend disbelief. You then have to imagine that you have a civilian government that has an ideology that differs from the army. And one of the, the, the very solid things that you can observe across all of Pakistan's civil society, bureaucracies, and institutions is that they generally share the same notion of the two-nation theory. You know, you can look at, we could go at length, we could discuss the textbooks, we could look at the nonsense on Pakistani television, we could, newspapers, we just go on at length. So even if you manage to get the, the army out of power, there is no evidence whatsoever that the civilians view the world any differently. So, you know, I, it's hard for me to be optimistic, but I, I do think that one of the foundational problems with Pakistan's relationship in the world is this, this notion of a two-nation theory. I may add, it took a beating from the get-go, right? What, a third of India's Muslims chose to not leave. The loss of Bangladesh in 71, that's a huge nail in that coffin. And of course, the interesting and yet ironic thing, Pakistan's refusal to embrace some form of separation of mosque and state has made it increasingly untenable for Pakistan's majority to live in peace and security, right? These Dale Bundy terrorists are now going after Brailvis, calling them Manafakeen. So the greatest irony of all is Pakistan's failure to embrace separation of mosque and state is that really no Muslim can be safe over the long term as long as there are these well-armed kaminas deciding who is the right Muslim and, and, and arrogating their right to kill these people if they disagree with them. Thank you very much, Grace. We now come to Sarah, and uh, one of the key questions perhaps of the day is in Washington. And let me say that your intervention comes at the end of a cycle. We've seen, we have seen complete opposition to any role whatsoever, or very limited of India and Afghanistan, because it was a red flag to Pakistan, to something more acceptable and something to do. What do you, Indian, can do because we're leaving the country? So what is your views of the Indian role in Afghanistan in that context? Uh, and I, I just want to fin uh, want to come back to your previous question because I had I uh, about um, 
potential ways out because I forgot to say I said there in the abstract there are these ways that we could that the United States could reorganize its its policy what I forgot to say its political approach what I forgot to say is that I see absolutely no indications that there's any chance that we're going to do that so in the abstract that possibility exists but it's quite clear to me that the US government has decided to basically barrel ahead um, on some railroad tax on India you know, it's interesting the way you just phrased that, Frederic, because that's sort of, you know, here is India, which is a country whose vital national interests are actually engaged by how things turn out in Afghanistan. Um, and for a long time, any notion of Indian involvement in what's going on in Afghanistan on the ground was, as you point out, you know, sort of taboo because of the potential impact on Pakistan. Now that we need India as allegedly one of the grown-ups in the region and as one that may have some money, we're sort of saying, gosh, would India please get more involved? And I find that's a slightly condescending and limited way of doing it because it seems to me that... Um, there's a strategic level at which India has the right to be part of the discussion on how things go, uh, partly because of the vital national interests that are engaged and partly because of India's experience um, with regional dynamics. Unfortunately, I don't think, again, I think that there's a very strong um, bias uh, in the American administration to keep India's involvement to the tactical and material. Um, finally, on the sort of pan-Islamist or partition, I heard the word partition and my ears um, pricked up because I think um, a quite likely outcome if we set you know, the criminal uh, division of spoils aside, w another quite likely scenario for how things go in Afghanistan would actually be a kind of combination of partition and fusion, and not just Islamist and looking at sort of um, the south uh, east of Afghanistan semi-merging with Pakistan, but let's not forget the north, where we have an extremely fragile Tajikistan, which shares a long border with um, Tajik-speaking parts of Afghanistan, which is already a semi-non-border. So do you look at a kind of, uh, you know, sort of rough partition, you know, where Afghanistan s almost disappears into its neighbors, north and south? Uh, I'm not sure what, you know, how that would play out, and I'm not sure if that really <laughs> connects with your question, but it's, um, it's another potential geostrategic um, evolution. Well, you're right, and not sure it does really connect to the question, but that's indeed uh, an evolution. In any really academic seminar, we end up um, saying, well, this is this proved the need for further research, and therefore we need to continue. <laughs> but I mean, all good things have an end, and the time has come to close this session and to close this seminar. So with these words, I'd like to thank you all for having participated today. I'd like, of course, to thank all our panelists very deeply, but I'd like to also to thank Nida, Ready and Reese, who have been the, the, <coughs> the reorganizers of all this day, and thank you very much for giving my heart. Thank you.